All right, thank you very much, Roman, and all the organizers for putting this together. It's uh, really great to have this chance to tell you about this recent work. It's great to see many familiar names in the Zoom list. I wish we were all in the same space and we could you know, go for a drink and talk about really difficult integrals or something afterwards. Um, so I'm gonna talk about this recent paper, what it's like to be a bit, uh, that sort of builds, it's inspired by, um, in some ways, by integrated information theory. So I'm really grateful to Pelota for giving this introduction. Uh, so before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the people that actually did the work while I sat on Zoom meetings, uh, mostly Fernando Rosses and Andrea Lupi, but also Dan Bohr and Adam Barrett and other collaborators from Sussex, Imperial and the University of Cambridge. Cool, let's jump right in. I'm talking about IIT and talking about mathematical approaches to consciousness. I'd like to begin with a bit of a detour, uh, talking about axiomatic approaches to you know, various scientific fields, in particular consciousness. I'm talking about axioms and consciousness. One paper that I'd like to highlight, which I think is really fantastic, is this paper by Tim Bain on the information, the axiomatic foundations of IIT, on the integrated information theory of consciousness. And there's a fantastic paper that you should all go and read. Uh, but in particular, I'd like to highlight one paragraph near the end of the conclusion of this paper that says this, there are good reasons to think that the axiomatic method is not well suited to the study of consciousness. Axiomatic methods are most closely associated with mathematics and logic, and one will not find any mention of them in accounts of explanation in the mechanical or life sciences. Now, in a mathematical theory, you know, being mathematicians talking about consciousness and in a conference about mathematical consciousness science is a bit conflicting. So where should we stand with respect to this statement by Tim Bain? Uh, so just to give you a you know, hint about where I stand on this, at the risk of being a bit more Catholic than the Pope, I'm going to say that actually, even in mathematics, uh, axiomatic methods are very limited. And I'm going to try to defend my position, but not myself. So let's hear it from the experts. Uh, I'm going to start by quoting these two gentlemen, Biden and Russell, uh, who you may agree that they knew a thing or two about axioms. Uh, and they have this, you know, this is long quote from their Principia book in 1925. And I'm only going to so sort of tell you about the latter bit in bold, which is that they really argue that one should believe the premises because the true consequences follow from them and not the other way around. You should not believe the consequences because they follow from some premises. So the axioms or the premises themselves are not enough to justify the truth value of anything that follows afterwards. Uh, and talking about information theory in particular, uh, Claude Shannon in his seminal 1948 paper, Shannon depicted here absolutely killing it on the unicycle, uh, he says, after proving the theorem that the formula for entropy uniquely follows from some axioms, he says, this theorem and the assumptions required for its proof are in no way necessary for the present theory. It is given chiefly to lend a certain plausibility to some of our later definitions, but the real justification of these definitions, however, will reside in their implications. So the axioms are basically, you know, Again, being a bit, you know, using a bit strong word in here, being a bit blunt, they're a bit worthless in and of themselves. They only matter in so far as they help us solve real scientific and engineering questions uh, in the case of Shannon himself. So what does this mean for consciousness? In consciousness science, axiomatic approaches begin with introspection. So we look inside, we sit in an armchair and we think, oh, how is you know, this experience? Or how can I axiomatize it? Um, but these things are really limited. You know, introspection is limited enough and faulty and it's a bit of a, sort of um, circular reasoning here because you know consciousness science itself and psychology tells us that our introspection is very limited in many ways so you know it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem uh, so my take here my overall approach is that introspection is very important by experiments are important to, in consciousness science um, so my take home message and the overall approach to the problem is what i'm going to try to do in this talk is that you know, we're developing this new approach to consciousness theory that is somehow inspired by but different from IIT, but that crucially downplays the role of axioms and prioritizes progressive empirical validation to ground the theory into meaningful um, empirical developments. And all this is enabled by new mathematical and empirical developments based on the theory on a framework of information decomposition, which I'm going to talk about briefly. So in this talk, I'm going to split into parts roughly. First, I'm going to talk about the concept of synergy, and I'm going to introduce integrated information decomposition of phi ID. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give some hints as to what an empirical research program based on phi ID might look like. And if you're interested, these are the two papers that you can go and read about uh, to know more about these two things. 
So let's dive right in. Uh, let's talk about integrating information in composition. And to do that, I have to begin by talking about its predecessor, partial information decomposition, or PID, as was presented by Williams and Beer some time ago in 2010. So in PID, we want to decompose the mutual information that two source variables have about one target variable. So this mutual information is split into four information atoms, as they call them. Synergy, unique information, and redundancy. So synergy is information that two variables have about a target jointly, but not separately. Unique information is the information that one variable has, but not the other. Therefore, there's two of them. And the redundancy, which is the information that both of them have uh, independently of each other. And as you see on the right, this can be represented in a lattice, which is a type of partially ordered set, where sort of low order information is at the bottom, like some redundancy, and high order information is at the top, like synergy. Uh, and of these, uh, basically the one we are most interested, again, in particular in the context of IIT, is synergy, which essentially quantifies information that's contained in the whole, but not in the parts. Uh, and if you, you know, to give a quick example of how these things, you know, how to conceptualize these things, one very sort of quick example is to think of the two eyes, our two eyes as sources of visual information about the world. In this context, for example, uh, information about color would be redundant because if you close one eye, or the other, you can still see color, uh, so therefore it's redundant. But synergy would be, for example, information about depth, where if you close either eye, you lose it. And it's only by having both of them that you see that you can perceive information about depth by and large. Now, when we when it comes to applying this to say neural recordings from neuroimaging or any form of you know brain measurement device, um, the brain is sort of dynamical. We, we can model the brain as a multivariate dynamical system with many parts evolving jointly over time. And in dynamical systems, there's really no natural source target division. We can't say, well, these are the sources providing information about this other variable. So we can't neatly apply PID to, say, for example, a neuroimaging like an EEG or an fMRI recording. So we would need some form of extension of PID to, to apply to multivariate systems. So can we do this? Can we extend PID to multivariate systems? Of course, you know, the reason I'm here is that the answer is yes. And the way we do this is with this new framework of integrated information decomposition or FIID. So the way we do FIID very quickly is basically it's like sort of PID squared, where we basically have a forward PID decomposing the information that goes from the past to the future, and the backward PID decomposing the information from the future to the past. So this gives four atoms one way and four atoms the other way. That gives a total of 16 atoms. So every combination of redundancy, unique, and synergy in the past and future. And similarly, we can arrange these in a lattice, um, which as before has sort of the double redundancy at the bottom and the high order sort of double synergy at the top. And if you sum all of those together, the total is what we call the TDMI or the time delayed mutual information. That's basically the whole information that the whole system is carrying from one time step to the next. Um, I'm implicitly assuming that things are Markovian here because it makes things a lot simpler, but some of this can be generalized as well to non-Markovian systems. Um, and this lattice basically provides a full taxonomy of information dynamics that can happen in the system. Right? So we can talk about information storage as sort of information that remains in the same kind of modality that it was before. We can talk about transfer, but then we can talk about other types of information dynamics that haven't really been explicitly studied, like copy, for example, where information was unique in the past and becomes redundant in the future. So it has been copied from one variable to the other. And then I think that's other things like that causation and so on. So, okay, now we have this FIID framework, what can we do with it? Uh, one very interesting feature of FIID is that actually many common information measures can be seen as subsets of this FIID lattice. So you can take measures of information storage or transfer entropy or causal density, or even measures of integrated information. And here I'm showing in particular the sort of version 2.0 of the theory. Uh, and all of these can be seen as subsets of the same unifying space of information atoms within FIID. Uh, so we really see FIID as a unified common space to describe many measures spanning different phenomena in information dynamics. And in particular, we can look at this phi measure that was sort of inspired by the measure by Baluzzi and Tononi in 2008, but was really written down by Barron and Seth in 2011. And I'm gonna call this the home in a sum Phi. That's basically the mutual information between the whole system and its own feature minus the sum of the mutual information between 
the parts of the system on their own features. So basically, how much better is the whole system at predicting itself over and above the individual parts predicting themselves? And the idea is that if this quantity is positive, then the interaction between the parts is somehow important or relevant for predicting the dynamical evolution of the system. So we can basically go and apply the whole fire machinery to this uh, quantity. And on the whole, we can actually decompose this into greater information. So we can see that actually the homeless sum phi is not a monolithic construct, but it's actually sort of an amalgamation of these different phenomena. So it compresses the synergy. It also compresses information transfer between the two parts of the system. And it has this negative redundancy component, which you know can cause some weird behaviors that have been reported in the literature before. So we can do this, we can form, we can use this phi machinery to formulate a revised phi or fire without the negative redundancy. And now we basically have the almost a fraction of the total information that is carried either synergistically or transferred between the parts of the system. Or we can call this measure fire. All right, so now that we have put together all these sort of phi D infrastructure, we can then move on to the more consciousness centric side of things. So what's next? What, what can we do with this framework in terms of consciousness science? Um, I argue, and sort of me and my collaborators have been working on the possibilities that FIID offers for an empirical research program on consciousness. And we're going to see two applications of this FIID method in this conference. Um, first of all, we can, well, not first of all, but one thing that we can do is we can talk about compatibilities between IIT and global workspace theory if you're interested in this, you should go and check out Andrew Lucas' talk on Thursday at 5 p.m. UTC. And in here, what I'm particularly interested to tell you today is about how FIID can enable a multidimensional view of consciousness and it can span an array of multidimensional measures of consciousness. So philosophically and more sort of on a phenomenological level, it is fairly clear and it's fairly well studied that aspects of subjective experience can be divided into different dimensions. And then I'm going to highlight two examples, which I think are particularly beautiful. One is this amazing 2010 uh, paper on by Fallen by the Oncometer on the neurobiology of psychedelic drugs, uh, where they give different doses of different substances to participants, and they measure how they score in different aspects of phenomenology of the so some phenomenological questionnaires. And it's amazing because we see that basically giving these participants different dose of the same substances. It's basically like if you imagine a space where each of these um, items is a, a dimension, is basically a vector in the same direction but increasing magnitude as the dosage increases. So you can really, you know, there's a space of phenomenology that has certain structure and certain regularities and we can manipulate them in reasonably controlled ways by using, in this case, psychedelic drugs, but possibly other techniques as well. And then there's this other more recent paper by Birch et al, where they apply a similar kind of reasoning, but for animal consciousness. And they argue that different animals have different components of these different moving parts of phenomenological experience. And the way that we see this whole framework going is that actually we can project aspects of experience and aspects of information dynamics into some sort of common space. So the goal is to find the mapping between these two different spaces of phenomenology and information dynamics. And this, you know, as you know, being at the interface between theory and experiment, this is super flexible because we can have two approaches basically. We can on one side we can make some a priori judgments um, from one to another. So we can think about it, we can do philosophy about certain aspects of experience. We can say, well, given this and that consideration, we can hypothesize that this will be characterized by this particular property of the physical substrate of whatever. Um, but also it opens up the opposite where we can have this a posteriori type of inference where we can just analyze neuroimaging data, compute or you know, study properties of information dynamics and then sort of reason back, to see what they mean or what's their correlate in terms of these underlying dimensions of consciousness. Uh, so by doing this sort of iteratively back and, this back and forth game between theory and experiment, the goal end game basically is that we see information atoms as a sort of Rosetta Stone or consciousness, um, or we can translate from one to the other. Um, so a bit with a tongue in cheek, uh, I'm going to sort of throw the following analogy from, you know, sometime back, there's a somewhat influential paper you may have heard of claiming that we can't sort of 
extrapolate directly the experience of being a bat from the experience of being a human. Well, the sort of ideal end goal for all this research program is that you know we would like to do so through this intermediate common space of information dynamics. So maybe we can't know exactly what it is to be a bat, but we can hypothesize what it's like to be a brain that processes information in a particular kind of way. And that can be described to through FIRE to use some similar framework for information dynamics. Uh, and you can find more information about this in this paper, uh, what it's like to be a bit, which you should uh, be able to find in the PSI archive available as preprint. More broadly, uh, this is, I would like, just like to give a quick um, heads up here to this thing that Anil Seth dubbed the real problem of consciousness. Um, so the real problem of consciousness in the words of Anil Seth is how to account for the various properties of consciousness in terms of biological mechanisms without pretending it doesn't exist and without worrying too much about explaining its existence in the first place. So basically we just chip away at the problem of consciousness by you know, explaining more and more of these dimensions uh, and slowly the hard problem of consciousness won't be solved, it will just be dissolved. We'll just you know, explain away different aspects of information and consciousness and physiology and eventually you know that will give us a satisfying account of consciousness um a bit over time i would like to finish real quick by telling you about a quick hypothesis of how this method can actually come to fruition relating synergy and the self um so in a spot of ID, there's this item this particular atom in FIRD that's called causal decoupling and it's sort of synergistically stored information. It's information that's synergistic in the past and the future. And it's a sort of flying ghost that is independent of any particular element of the substrate, but that actually has some causal power over the system and over itself. And there's an example you can think of um, particles in the game of life that sort of interact with each other, but it's sort of at a higher level compared to the individual cells. And for some reasons you can find in the paper, we can hypothesize that actually causal, cell, causal decoupling can be correlated with a sense of with the selfhood of a system. So we can make sort of, you know, Venn diagrams and study the information content of different chunks of the FIRD. And lo and behold, I'm gonna skip some of this. Uh, we try, we tested this on source localized MEC data from subjects under the influence of psychedelic drugs. And we see that causal decoupling decreases in the psychedelic state. And actually it's correlated with uh, self reports of ego dissolution in the default mode network, which is a region of the brain associated with self monitoring and self related processing in general. So, as a quick wrap up, uh, we have introduced FIRD as a unifying framework for information dynamics. We have highlighted the crucial role of synergy, both in theory and experiments, and opened up a few possibilities for a FIRD based empirical research program on consciousness. And that's it from me. There's a bunch of questions open mathematical, experimental, and philosophical. And so long and thanks for all the fish.